how different does a remake have to be to not be overshadowed by the original? Let's talk about it. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. We are back, the Out of the Storm podcast. Before we get into the main discussion, we're here to give you movie recommendations. So, guys, what's the best recent thing we've seen? So this week I watched Old Boy from 2003. That's the Korean version. Like this is not the most obscure pick. Uh, I'm sure most people have seen it, but I saw it for the first time this week, and I heard good things about it, but I was not prepared. So the idea of Old Boy is that a Korean businessman essentially gets abducted and gets held prisoner in a locked room for over a decade. He gets he gets released without explanation. His wife has been killed, and he's been framed for the murder. And his daughter has been adopted by an overseas family. So he has nothing left, right? He lost his job, he lost his reputation, he lost his family. And he basically just gets dumped somewhere and is basically left to figure things out. And he then goes on a quest to find out who ruined his life and to take revenge. And it's a revenge story, but not in the way you think. And it's kind of renowned for its twist ending, so I'm not going to talk about it. But essentially... It is different from most revenge stories, which are kind of power fantasies and are meant to deliver catharsis. And this just takes a different approach. And it's got some great action in it, some great performances. The story is is quite something. So if if you disliked The Beekeeper earlier, as some present here have, then you might like this. Because it's just a similar idea, but very different. So I also kind of watched a revenge-based movie as well. Revenge-based, would you say, whatever? I mean, it's probably one that, like, most people have seen. It's uh, Rebel Ridge on Netflix. I totally don't have the luxury of, like, having too much time to sort of kind of, like, watch different things. So I try to, like, just, like, put random things on sometimes. But I watched this, and it, it's your typical super-powered army, ex-army vet or whatever, that goes into a small town, kind of, like, discovers some type of, like, corruption. He's kind of trying to stay out of the fight or not be involved. He just, well, well, in this in this particular situation is that his cousin's been arrested. He's just going there to like post bail and get his cousin out and whatever. But then kind of gets like swept up in this sort of kind of conspiracy that's going on in this sort of small town. And of course it does a thing where it's like, you know, he's reluctant to be sort of the hero. And then something happens, which obviously then like pushes him into some sort of action essentially. And then from there, it's just your typical action slugfest pretty much. So it's not really the type of movie that I would, normally watch or kind of like go with or like sort of even like sing phases about to be honest but this one was actually pretty decent i mean it, it, it doesn't do anything extraordinary what i did like is it, it it did try to like have a little bit more of a nuanced villain or like a little bit more of a nuanced sort of conspiracy that was going on and justify why what was going on was going on which was like quite cool i actually like that but overall it's it's like if you like things like the equalizer and stuff like that if you like that type of movie then you'll probably like rebel Ridge as well it's like just you know solid action movie from netflix for me, I actually ended up watching two movies. One was Inside Out 2 and the other one was Acromany. Acromany, pretty much, it's a Tyler Perry movie. And in this film, a wife starts to lose faith in her husband because she's pretty much like the breadwinner and the one that's that's kind of like the man in the relationship. And then it gets to the point where um, she divorces him. And then, because he's like an invent, I think he, I forgot what his profession was, but he was studying to be like some sort of he was like an inventor or something right and then it finally ends so when she divorces him it finally he finally ends up getting successful from it and then she just goes on a whole rampage and vengeance against him it was a Tyler Perry movie I feel like Tyler Perry movies it's you know typical not ghetto but it's like you know this little black man like black couple that's going through a bunch of madness can i just say i've never understood the appeal of tyler perry movies like even like medea and stuff like that which people do love i don't I, it, it's never really been my type of thing but i'm not I, to be fair, I probably should have said that. i'm not here to like you know shit on stuff that you like to be fair, or, any, or anyone that does like that but yeah it's tyler, tyler perry i've never understood it it's, he's never had like the best kind of like writing and stuff like that in his in his movies Damn, Tyler Perry's uh, he's like my hero, man. His history is inspirational, but his movies are fun, though. I think it's not his his movies aren't iconic, but they are. Some people argue against this, but I feel like they're feel good movies where you're just gonna go watch the film and just have a fun time with the family or friends, like especially for like the black community. So that's just for me how I see his movies. Like, oh, is a Tyler Perry movie coming out? That's a fun film. That's right. It looks like it's time for the main discussion. 
Danny G, please give the people a synopsis of what the hell we watched last week. So Speak No Evil is a psychological horror thriller about this family that goes on vacation to Italy, meets this other family that they really hit it off with. And that family then proceeds to invite the first family to their country farm just for a weekend to to hang out. But over, over time, uh, awkward situations get more and more sinister until it turns out that the, the host family is trying, trying to prey on them and is actually dangerous to them. And then things develop from there. So what were our overall impressions of Speak No Evil? I loved this movie. This movie was fantastic. One thing that I haven't mentioned is that, like, whilst I'm not a horror fan, I do love a good psychological thriller. And this this is probably why I rate it so highly. But I went into this completely blind as to sort of what this movie was meant to be about. I know people online have said, like, you know, they've been hitting us over the head with the trailer for this movie, but I actually haven't seen it anywhere. I don't know why. I, I, I must have been sort of you know, avoiding it, turning up to the cinema late and this and the other. So uh, I've done well to avoid the trailer because it apparently re- reveals too much but I mean, I've, I've seen the trailer in front of every movie i've seen in the last four months mm-hmm. so it, it was everywhere so i'm not sure how you manage that like do you just not watch the trailers or i i turn up i turn up just as the movies probably started to be fair right. i, I kind of like You're one of those I'm, I'm one of those people yeah <laughs> yeah pretty much but yeah no like on onto the actual movie it, itself i thought it was fantastic in terms of like the atmosphere in terms of like the tension that was like building up and building up throughout some of the whole movie uh in this there was like some of the particular scenes where you just kind of like felt on edge and you just never knew where it was going to go and obviously you kind of like expect sort of that like what happens at the end to happen where like things sort of eventually go sour and things eventually sort of kind of come to fruition or whatever but what they did well was just like have like scenes where You thought it was going to happen there. You thought the tension was building up. You thought, like, you know, the plot was going to be revealed. But then it then just, like, kind of, like, delays it a little bit further. And it's just, like, I think there's a line in the movie which kind of, like, explains the movie well where where it says, like, the hunt is better than the kill. And in this movie, it's, like, everything about, like, the build-up, everything about, like, the dynamics between the families and this and the other. It's just great. And obviously you get like the, the payoff at the end. Outside of like the story, the story, the atmosphere, I felt like there was like kind of like great performances from sort of James McAvoy. He like really was like very intense in this like in this role, very like dominant and very like over like overbearing in terms of sort of you know, his presence anytime he was on, on screen in this. We'll get into the discussion in the spoiler section in terms of like what I actually want to sort of kind of like talk about this, uh, about this. But overall, this was like probably my second favorite movie of the year behind Dune part two. I can't even remember what else came out this year, but this is definitely my second favorite movie of the year. This was this was great. And that's why I had to go and watch the movie twice. Because when I'm looking in the group chat and I hear someone saying this is the second favorite movie before Dune, I'm like, what the hell? Don't don't get it twisted. When I saw the trailer for this movie, I was looking forward to it. Um, I was like, this is my kind of film. Like, you know, psychological thrillers or horrors or whatever genre this is going to go under by. This is just my type of film. So I was like, great. But then when I saw that this guy said, Oh, second best movie of the year. I'm like, what the hell? So I had to watch this movie twice because when I first watched it, I kind of took it at face value, exactly the same as how I took in the trailer. I just thought to myself, simple storyline with the selling point pretty much going to be the mystery behind not knowing the extent of the abuse and the madness of the couple, James and his Mrs. Sierra, I believe. So I thought, okay, cool. And then when I watched the movie, I was like, yeah, this is like a like he's a good movie like the performance i thought this movie was like going to be a film that's going to be known for his performances because the performances all around was amazing so i was like cool i'm like why is this movie like so highly rated like is there things that i missed so i watched it again yesterday and i was like okay i understand why people watch movies twice now because i never used to be that type of guy but now i feel like i am going to be that type of guy especially for movies that I enjoy. Because like I said, the first time I watched this movie, I enjoyed it. So the second time I enjoyed it even more because I picked up on so much stuff that I didn't pick up the first time around. It was way deeper than just a crazy couple. The theme of hunt, peer pressure, decision-making and seeking the truth throughout this movie and the way that they were answered as well. It was a great movie. Like, don't get twisted, the performances were amazing. My favourite performance in this movie, everyone's going to mention James. Shout out to James. But for me, it was Dave and it was Louis, Louise or Louise. I don't know first name basis with James McAvoy. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm on the first. You know what I'm after watching Split, I don't see Xavier and X Men cool, but after watching Split, that guy became my guy. He's James now. But after this movie as well, he's definitely James. But he was amazing in this movie. But for me, the highlight was Dave and it was Louise. But yeah, it was. This movie was good, man. So I have a very different experience. Say, come, come, come in and out of Jonathan. <laughs> oh no, Jonathan. Sorry, Dave, Daniel. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So. So we are recording this on a, t- on a Tuesday. I saw the movie on a Sunday and I saw the Danish original on a Friday. And I think the, the way you experience this movie and what effect it has on you really depends on whether or not you've seen the original. And it's been two days since I saw the new movie and I still am not entirely sure if I like it or not because it comes down to a couple of different things. One of them is that's a really poor uh, remake, like it, it to the point of where it basically misses the point of the original, and because the original is such an intense psychological horror movie, it's it's like a remake of a psychological horror movie that drops the psychological part. It's it's it really is that extreme. But what's left is a really good thriller movie, right? I think I think don't think this is a horror movie. I think this is a thriller movie where this does tension like nothing I've seen in years. Like there are scenes in this where. I legitimately felt dread, which is not something that happens very often in movies these days for me. Um, it's it's just extremely effective at building up an atmosphere and creating implied tension between characters based on their previous interactions and the rules that have been set up. And it is quite well written and it is really well acted and everything. And by itself, it's an excellent movie. And I, I am not sure this is enough. And I've, I've not made, made up my mind about this, but... It essentially, it, it is very close to the original, to the point where entire scenes are lifted word for word. But then it makes very significant changes. Specifically the ending. The ending is completely different. A completely different tone, completely different message, completely different approach. But even before that, there are differences where I, on balance, I think there are bad changes that make the story weaker and make it make less sense. And we can get into that in, in the full spoiler sh- section. So... For me, it is simultaneously amazing and a terrible movie, and I don't know which of those two will win out, especially considering that the original is just two years old and it's right there, you can watch it. And it, that that one is not a perfect movie either, but it kind of does what it wants to do very effectively, and this one doesn't really try. And for that reason, I'm kind of still on the fence, even even several days later, whether or not this is actually a good movie or not. Would you have Let's the discuss. same opinion if you didn't watch the original? If I didn't watch the original, I think I, this this would be an amazing thriller. Okay. But because I know, I, I can see the fragments. Like it's kind of wearing the corpse of the first movie as a coat. It is not sufficiently different from the original where I can say, okay, similar premise, but different movie. It is like the, the, the break is not clean enough for that. So I don't want to just make this about the original, but I cannot divorce my reaction to the movie from my reaction to the original because it's just that close, and it's because and because it's that recent. Well, we kind of do have to like get into the original just a bit because I'm trying to understand like what exactly about the original made this film better. Yeah, so this is the spoiler section for both both versions, right? So I'm just, just going to go, go all out. So the original has a couple of important differences. One of them is that the nationalities are different. So in the original, the victim couple, and this is difficult to talk about because all the names are different except for Louise. For some reason, they kept one name but changed all the other names. So the victim couple is Danish and the murder couple is Dutch. And they meet in Italy on holiday and then they invite the Danish couple to visit them in the Dutch countryside. The nationalities are important for the character characterization and for the plot and for the ge- um, geography of how the plot unfolds. And I think the way, like like in the 2024 version, the fact that they are made, like the victim couple is made American, it really does do harm to the plot because the entire story is not just about social awkwardness, it's not just about politeness. It's about social conditioning, where your culture has you so programmed to not make a fuss and not seek out conflict and not stand up for yourself and to avoid upsetting the other person, even if it's to your own detriment, that this does not translate into American culture. It just doesn't. People have said a lot of things about Americans, but they've never said that Americans don't, like, aren't assertive and don't stand up for themselves. 
I actually thought that they probably should have switched the nationalities and made the couple that sort of kind of like are doing the sort of the murders and stuff like that American and made the sort of kind of like yeah. passive and polite sort of a couple British just because it kind of fits like like you're saying that it fits the sort of culture a little bit more um, specifically Danish culture. So the original author is Danish, and he wrote about. Um, Danish culture, so I, I like a, I like a culture that he has experienced firsthand, where he has seen this in action, right? Obviously, this is an exaggerated version, but he has seen this in action where people don't stand up for themselves and don't, and and the and the norm of not making a fuss and avoiding confrontation is so strong that it, it's to people's detriment. That's what this movie is about, because in in the original, Louise and Ben are so passive and so so meek. That they don't even fight back when they're being killed, and when, oh, when they watch when they watch their daughter's tongue being cut out with a scissor, it's like it's that extreme. Oh crap! Okay. Right? And this is like, and this movie is about like, this is an empowerment movie, right? This is like Louise steps up and is the big hero in the end, right? Ben is still timid and passive and everything, but Louise sta- like becomes an action hero in the end, right? And that is just a very like I'm not saying that's a bad story. I'm saying it's a different story, mm-hmm. and that's kind of the bottom line. That it's not like the chain, like it's it, it doesn't change it into a bad story, but it kind of misses the point of the original. Mm. And but I like, think because they made that more universal. And also, I think mm. I think they were kind of like touching like in in terms of like what I saw from it was there was there was a lot more focus on like the difference in masculine masculinity between sort of you know uh, Paddy and is it Ben where like Paddy is like overconfident at first is portrayed to have like really sort of a good job in terms of like him being a doctor lives in the countryside is like literally your typical like man's man in this mm-hmm. and then like ben is completely the opposite he's like i mean they're kind of like doing well but like things aren't completely going for him in life i think there's like the situation where like he's like been rejected from something that he was kind of going for he's a little bit underconfident he lost his job and like his yeah. uh he, he apparently had a job lined up uh, for later and then he gets a call from the headhunter and that doesn't they like yeah. that through yeah and even even like the situation on the holiday where uh which is funny because they obviously like they gave the nod to the danish movie by having the danish couple in there being like super annoying where it, it seems like for the majority of the holiday they've been stuck with this danish couple because like he hasn't had like the balls to sort of kind of break away from that and like just be a little bit more dismissive and just like not sort of entertain them where Again, on Paddy's side of things, he just like just a little bit like more confident in terms of like handling that situation. So I, I feel like that was like an interesting dynamic. And then obviously you then have like the play of like Louise from that because like she's got like such a I wouldn't I don't want to call him like a weak timid man, but he was like quite like passive in this and he was like quite accepting, so, yeah. accepting everything that was going on. And then obviously she's a little bit stronger than herself and obviously she's kind of like looking to him for guidance and stuff like that but then she's not getting it from him so then she then has to like step up and like be that figure and be like that more dominant masculine figure in their relationship because he's just like and 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 it also ties into like her like emotionally cheating in this as well because obviously they they allude to like the affair that she's having and stuff like that so that's kind of how I saw that they were like approaching it a little bit different in terms of like because I have heard like or I have read up about like the first movie and stuff like that and it being about that particular culture. But I, I feel like that's where they maybe deviated and tried to make it a little bit sort of different to what the original was in terms of like the messaging and sort of no, in terms of sort of no, what what kind of like led them to that situation. So the gender stuff is very much a thing of the remake. In the original, Louise and Ben, I'm going to use the 2024 names just to keep it simple. Uh, Louise and Ben are both equally timid and passive. And it's not about masculinity. So Paddy is not as masculine and he's less repressed, but he's not like this swaggering macho guy that that the James McAvoy version is. He's more, he's more more true to himself. So a couple of couple, couple of important differences is Louise did not cheat on Ben in the in the original version. And another one is that there is the scene between Paddy and Ben when they're in the car. Uh, I think they're going off, I think, to go to a market or something, and they take this detour to this old quarry, and they talk about how unhappy Ben is. And it's not really about masculinity. It's just about Ben feeling trapped in his upper-middle-class urban professional life, where he can't be himself. He has to do things he doesn't like. He he has to hang out with people he he doesn't care about. And it's all appearances, and it's all empty, and it's all ritual. And he doesn't live anymore, essentially. 
And Petty essentially gives him permission to kind of break free from that. So this whole shouting into the void thing has a very different connotation in the original, for example, right? So a lot of the details are very different and all the connotations are different. And so the original is much more about this, like the social conditioning that is specific to Danish culture and just general Northern European culture. Like growing up in Germany, I saw something similar, right? Where you simply don't talk about the unpleasant stuff and you kind of carry that with yourself for decades in many cases and until it becomes too much. I'm not referring to any specific personal experience, but that is how it's done, right? You, you don't openly talk about the bad things. You kind of just ignore them until they go away or, do, or don't, right? So this is a very much a Northern European thing that's not spe- not unique to, to Danish culture, but that entire region has this whole idea of don't make a fuss, smile through the unpleasantness, right? And that kind of just gets lost in the translations by making them American. And also it ties into this class idea. For instance, they are very, in the original, they're very concerned about environmentalism and keep going on about the, like the reason they drive to the farm and don't fly is because they've already flown twice that year and kind of they eat, they've eaten up the carbon budget. And so they, they, their entire life is, is determined by the perceptions of their peers, right? Like what will people say if they go on an air trip again? That kind of thing, right? And like th- that's like that's, that's a small thing, but it's like stuff like that is sprinkled throughout the entire movie where it's always about what will other people say and like other people's concerns are more important than their own comfort or safety. And that then is taken to an extreme when it comes to not fighting back against the social manipulation and eventual physical danger. So was there any, because it doesn't seem like there was any conflict between the couples in the um, original version. Is, Is that fair to say? So there's tensions between them, but they don't have the same kind of fight that they do in the, in the remake specifically because, uh, she has not been cheating on him. So that that rift doesn't exist between them. They are more generally unhappy and repressed. Because I was going to say, it seems like with the changes that they've made in this one, it creates more conflict amongst the couples, which for me, Percy, makes it more interesting. Because it sounds like with the original, I feel like I'd, you know, I feel like I'd resonate more with the one that we just watched in comparison to the original. And I think it's got to do with culture. As in, like, I'm more familiar with, I wouldn't say American culture, but yeah, kind of like American culture. Even though you did say that American couples haven't really been, like, American people really haven't really been seen in the light of where they're passive. But it goes back to my point before I said, I think they made, like, them more universal in terms of, like, there's always going to be, sometimes there's going to be one person in a couple that's, one person in the couple that's more passive and another person that's Mm -hmm. more, like, you know, up front. So that there, I think what they were trying to do with that is it shows the conflict that that could create because obviously Louise was more upfront and more direct, whereas like we said Dave was more um, passive. So for me, that kind of made it more interesting because it was like you could see the constant conflict that was coming from that. But what I'm trying to say is that I think the reason why you may have um, resonated more with that one, and I think I wouldn't have resonated more with that one, is because this one just had more conflict. And in terms of like the culture of where, like, in terms of like, culture here i think we're more gravitated towards drama as in like conflict arguing etc etc whereas with that other one it's very like you said it's very passive and you said there was conflict but not to the extent of the original and that's just it's kind of they are aware that they are in a situation they shouldn't be in Mm. but they are so so strongly conditioned that they cannot see a way where they would get physical about it Mm. even in self-defense and it's taken to a comical degree because it's satire but it's rooted in this idea of any kind of physicality being completely anathema. So you were saying things about relating to the characters in one or the other. And I couldn't relate to the ones in the first either. And it's a very difficult watch. And it's very, very, it's very unpleasant. It's very heavy. It's very draining. But it, it kind of pulls, slowly pulls you into the situation where you kind of can see them go along with every step of the way until it's finally too late. And whereas in the remake, it's more abrupt. Paddy, for instance, does not get nearly as physical as he does in the, in the remake, for instance. It's all about uh, like this whole idea of why you're doing this to us because you let me. There were a lot of situations where the Danish couple could have could have escaped. Could have gone just could have could have like and and there's this famous scene with the bunny right which i think is one one scene that kind of where where, where uh, the movie loses a lot of the audience because that is just a step too far for many people but like there, there are many things like there's even a scene in the remake where um paddy has abducted the couple right and is driving them to the slaughter 
and he gets out of the car to do something outside and he leaves the keys in the ignition and Ben sees the keys and he doesn't take them, right? Because he's that timid and that intimidated and that passive. So it's it really, it's taken to an extreme. And and I'm, I'm having a hard time kind of exactly drawing the line of what this should be. But like the movie, the, the original movie makes a point about social conditioning and politeness and it goes beyond being polite and it goes beyond being uh, a bit awkward or something like, or, or being in an awkward situation. Um, I've seen a lot of reviews specifically from Americans that simply don't get it. And that's not a general dig at Americans, but like if you come from an American cultural background, this whole idea of not making a fuss is alien to you. I think changing the cultural background of this really does, it doesn't kill the movie outright, but it really does damage to the integrity of the story because it's, I think you have to construct the story completely differently when you're doing, dealing with other cultures, such as Americans. And I think the believability of the story, I think the, 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 the there's very few opinions that I've seen where they like the remake better than the original. But if they do, it's usually because they think, oh, they act like real people in this. But this is the one where they turn into action heroes and it turns into a siege and a gun battle. And But like I think the way the people act in the original, f f for most people, most of the time is going to be more the more realistic one, even if it's exaggerated. Because, like, I've never been in a fight. Like, I, walk, I walked into a knife fight in London once, like, turned around a corner where two people in a knife fight, and I was paralyzed. Couldn't do anything. Like, rationally, I knew, okay, probably should run away. But, yeah. and I was lucky that the two kind of disengaged until I was gone, and then they went back to what they were doing. But I could have gotten really hurt, right? Because I'd never been in a violent situation before. And I'm nowhere near as conditioned as the people in this movie are, Right. And so I think this whole idea of what's realistic and what real people would do, I think that really depends on who you are and what your background is and what kind of life experiences you have. I, so I, I think I could relate to the first first couple on that level, that what, what is realistic and what isn't and what somebody would actually do in that situation depends a lot on your actual life experiences and your cultural background. And I think that kind of matters in this story. And I don't know that the remake has a thesis or much in the way of ideas in that because it's too close to to the to the original. But I, I, I feel like where they've like devi deviated is that masculinity aspect because I feel like they make a very strong point of it throughout like sort of no, multiple points in the movie where like Louise is constantly looking to Ben for like that show of strength or for that show of support. Even like that particular scene where um, Paddy's made the dinner and obviously Louise is vegetarian uh, and he's like, oh, just try, it, just try, it, just try, it. and like. Ped, like Ben isn't standing up for her. Ben isn't being strong for her in that situation. And there's like so there's like just, there's, for me there's like so many like points in the movie where it's like emphasized kind of like the difference between some of the two men in the movie that and and you're like you're like you're you're saying about like the point of the movie. Uh, and this is not to like kind of like speak for like the author or like whoever wrote this movie or whatever like that. But you know part of like what's discussed at the moment or in like modern day is like some like things like toxic masculinity and things like that and I like to me like as you're like kind of like explaining the point of like the first movie and this that, and the other to me like I'm trying to like piece together what like why they would make the changes and like what sort of know what they're trying to say for me and like part of what I'm getting from it is that like yeah this like toxic masculinity that like people sort of know um that was like around for ages where you're like the kind of like the typical like macho man like Paddy was like physically dominant and like he was a hunter and this and the other that was like obviously like bad for its time and like you know obviously needed to go away but I, I feel like there's like some type of commentary there about sort of you know, this new masculinity and about like this kind of like timid and weak man and like again even pointing to the fact that the couple were American probably even like again this is me like this is me maybe reaching a little bit but even like points to that because like Americans are used to like being known as being sort of no again like loud opinionative, opinionative and this that, and the other and not sort of uh, as timid. But sort of making the couple American could also be feeding into into sort of that particular narrative of like this is what society is kind of like turning men into and this that, and the other and maybe like this to toxic masculinity isn't good, but maybe this new wave of like sort of no, this like timid man who's like whatever isn't the way to go either, uh, to be honest. It's, it's kind of like how I'm trying to rationalize what the sort of kind of like point of the story was or what they were trying to like maybe like even get at. I don't think you're reaching at all. I think that's exactly what was on the mind of the author. What saves the day in the end is Louise, right? Yeah. Like it's not like Ben overcomes 
his conditioning where any form of aggression has kind of been beaten out of him essentially and he kind of finds a third way where he is the appropriate amount of violent right which is defending like not defending his woman but defending the people he loves right that's not toxic right well, he doesn't like, do not in that situation yeah, he but do he it. doesn't do that right he remains as you weak and useless but does that not tie into <laughs> as well where right? they, that, they kind of don't change like there's a scene where he tries to set the roof on fire with a multiple co cocktail and misses yeah, because he, because he throws like a girl, right? Yeah. Right, and that was very like that's not my words. That's kind of what the movie is saying, right? Yeah. Well, no, well I'm saying I'll tie into like the first movie or like the original movie where you're saying like the couple didn't change throughout, like in, yeah. in spite of like everything that they were going through, in spite of like all the dangers that they were facing, they didn't change. And like, granted, of course, like in this situation, of course, he's going to try, but ultimately, the failures that led him to be in this position is what's sort of kind of like making him fail in this situation and it's it's crazy because like in the movie i was i was rooting for him to change i was rooting for him to like be like assertive even when he was like in in that sort of in the wardrobe where he was like hiding and with a hammer and i thought he was gonna like attack the guy and like sort of you know, kill him it didn't end up being him it ended up being louise in that situation because he was like pathetic in his attempt to do it which really drove me crazy in in, in the cinema but i i feel like that then has like the same parallels as, as the first movie and he, he does have like that one redemptive scene where he like kind of like jumps down from the roof and like breaks his ankle and then like has... also jumps into the lake to save Ant. Yeah, jumps into the lake to save Ant as well. Which yeah. is very stupid. So movie. he does something right, but the hero is very clearly Louise, and the movie's being celebrated for that. And the movie didn't have to do this. It could have had Louise and Ben save the day together, right? Because they find the right path and the right amount of physicality that this situation warrants. That's what they could have done, and they didn't. Possibly, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I didn't, yeah. I didn't have an, an, an issue with Louis being the uh, savior of the day. Yeah, but no. But if the point is to comment, comment on, like the, the, you, you, like the pendulum has swung to find the other direction. And now we have to find the best good, good middle, and then Ben doesn't find it. Mm -hmm. Like that's still, that's a statement on its own, right? Yeah. I so yeah, yeah. Enough, I just yeah. wanted to kind of go back. I was going to mention, right? Um, in terms of, I just think that we're viewing the couple wrong as in i don't know if the person who made this film had the intention of using them as a representation of american culture because you mentioned that well, i don't think it was uh, no yeah I, I exactly, it's, but... it's just there to make the make, make the story more relatable like they go through these mm -hmm. entire hoops of they moved to 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 london and then they lost their jobs but they have enough money to stay there for a while and and they're kind of trying to make it work, but they're not getting anywhere. And uh, there's there's a lot of effort and time spent on kind of explaining why there are Americans in London. Mm. Mm. So I know I don't, I don't know the story gains very much other than it makes it more accessible. Yeah. To, to yeah. American audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's how I took it. And yeah, but um, just I was gonna say, just to like kind of like move the kind of conversation forward mm -hmm. please uh yeah uh I, I think we can all agree that like this movie built tension better than you know, a lot of movies have done you know, yeah. previously so like what are like some of you guys like kind of like highlight scenes in that and like what 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 do you think like why do you think it worked so well in this movie so for me by far the best one was when they are in the car and they're trying to get away and that's this whole thing about they've um, like they, they have a flat tire and the bunny is kind of landed on the roof and there's this entire sequence, right? Where they are basically trying to get away in a way without calling their bluff. And Paddy spe specifically is extremely polite, right? He's he's like fixing, like he's replacing, replacing their tire and he's helping get the bunny back from the roof, even though he's been making Ben do it and put almost killing him in the process and then blaming him kind of jokingly for it and stuff like that right but this entire scene where you don't know how far they will push this and how far Paddy and Kiara will let them push it because the prop chances are they're not going to just let them get away right and so this whole song and dance where they try where both sides try to keep up the masquerade essentially and you know it has to break at some point but you don't know where and when and how I think that was that was great specifically because the movie had sold me at that point on the idea that they were not going to pull the rug out from us 
where they would say like like where they would just ignore it or just break the rules like something had to happen and that something was that air deck that um paddy threw and in the uh, in, in the lake counting on the fact that they wouldn't just let him drown but like the the, the whole lead up like three the three or four minutes leading up to that like you could t- cut the tension with a knife like it was it was it was great Pro- may, may, might be one of the best scenes i've seen in a movie this year just because of how effective it was it did it did raise one plot hole I, I like i agree with you that was probably the best like tension scene it did create one plot hole which i was like oh, i wish i didn't think of it but like there's there's obviously when they leave the first time around and then obviously they have to go back for the bunny mm-hmm. my question is how did you leave without alerting anyone or waking anyone up when you have like this electric fence that you have to drive through to like get out of the property and then obviously they, they then use that as a crutch to kind of like keep them in the property like second time or like not like prevent them from leaving with the car this this sort of the second time round. So it, it created that one plot hole for me, but I do agree with maybe. you. That was like one of like the fantastic scenes. And to maybe like give a different example was when I can't remember what Louise was doing when she was like kind of like chopping something on the board and she like cut herself. And then they were, they're like to her, oh like you know what do we need to do? Like you're a doctor, this any other. And then he like just like deadpan says, well, I come. He basically implies that he's not a doctor. Yeah, he said he, I'm not a doctor. Yeah, and but then, then like, he backtracks it again, right? So Louise cuts yeah. her finger, chopping vegetables, and then Ben says, "Good thing we have a doctor in the house." And then Paddy goes to this whole thing of, "I'm not not really a doctor. I just said it. I said I was." And then when he sees the shocked face faces on uh, Louise and Ben, he says, "Ah, just kidding. I got you." Yeah. Notably, in the original, he does not do the last part. He just leaves it at. I, I, I'm pretending a doctor when I meet people because I'm self-conscious about being unemployed. Oh, wow, okay. So that is a change they made, and I think you could do an entire video essay about that change. But yeah, in, in the remake, he walks it back and says, oh, no, I'm kidding, of course I'm a doctor. Hmm. Well, I, without, well, obviously, like, not seeing seen the original. For me, it worked, like, perfectly well in terms of, like, just, like, that, like, one or two, like, seconds of, like, doubt as to, like, where, like, is he gonna like take it back? Is he not gonna take it back? And obviously, like they then sort of like break the tension by saying, "Of course, I'm joking, Miss Any other?" But like that was a highlight for me. But in in, in that, that, scene- that that is also sorry to interrupt. This is one of those scenes where I thought they made a change that kind of weakened the point because in the original, the point was that that kind of person, right, the urban upper middle, like what's what's the first question you ask somebody when you meet somebody? We we all live in London. We all work in in a corporate office. What's the first thing you do when you meet somebody socially? Oh, like what what do you do? What's your job? What do you do? Yeah. Right. So we judge people by what they do, not by how much money they have. Not really. Mm-hmm. Like salary has something to do with it. But ultimately, we want to know their profession and that determines who they are. And Paddy lied about who he was because the kind of people he's targeting will view him as one of them if he gives the right answer, which is I'm a doctor. By saying, oh, I, I'm, I, I, that's, a, that's a lie I tell to make a good first impression. He's taking away one of those things that made them trust him. Mm-hmm. And then he sees if they still trust him afterwards. I think that, in terms of him saying, I'm joking, I'm sort of a doctor, that still adds to the wary of trust because they're still yeah. losing trust in this couple, right? So it still kind of falls in place because right. they're doing another thing that's dodgy. So it's like, what the hell is going on with this couple? So it just builds off that, really. But that's the culture think... is you view people as like you or unlike you based on what they do. Mm-hmm. You react differently to somebody that says, I'm a doctor versus I'm like, I collect rubbish bins. You, mm-hmm. you file that person mentally into different categories. Yeah, right? yeah. And that is more pronounced for people like Louise and Ben, who are very status conscious and who everything they do is to impress their peers. And they care about things like appearances and CVs and which university they went to. Uh, like like one of the like maybe not the second question you would ask somebody, but one of the questions might be is where did you go to university? Because for that kind of person, that is one of the most important things. Right. That's that defines an identity. And by uh, Paddy not having that identity or saying he do, he doesn't. Like that, that kind of, that is relevant, right, to to how Louise and Ben view uh, the world and their place in it. So I don't, I, th- I think that is one of those changes that makes the theme weaker. And I don't know, I'm not sure what it adds by having that backtrack in there. You know what I mean? And it just makes the scene longer, it makes it more complicated. I don't know what you gain by doing it. But one thing you lose is that kind of thematic aspect of it i, yeah, I just no. don't know what would you put that scene in there if it wasn't in the original I, I don't think you would i think it's there because it's in the original and then they make this change for some reason that i don't understand which does not automatically make it bad but it's like it's stuck out to me because like the original has a lot of these things that are valid to serve a very specific purpose 
right? When when it comes to kind of explaining the psychology of Ben and Louise and why they do what they do and stuff like that, right? And it all kind of adds up over time. And here they kind of throw some spanners into the works. That doesn't necessarily make it a bad worse movie. It just it just stuck out to me that why would you do this, right? Well, like, you, like well, what do you gain? Well, you could argue that it actually does add to the continuous theme because for me right it kind of falls into place what i was going to say in terms of what my highlight moment was my highlight moment was when ben and paddy went for went went for fox hunting um mm-hmm. even though the scene before that was pretty good was pretty funny when he was obviously singing the song to ben and they were just in that awkward moment but not that scene it was the scene where um paddy said to him is not the kill for him is the hunt yep. so then for me it was like a light bulb switch and like everything just made sense now because like i said like one of the critiques which i actually wrote when i was um when i watched it the first time was what was the purpose for all of this i was like what was the purpose for the build-up of the insanity that the couple showed like, i don't get why they're tormenting him even like there was a scene where um at the end where paddy and the kitchen guy were cha- like they were chasing obviously um the couple and the kids and then he said what he said to the kitchen guy said to paddy why do you always play with your food before eating or something like that? And then, you know what I'm saying? So that falls into place with that. But pretty much when Paddy said to Ben, it's the hunt for him, I was like, okay, that makes sense now in terms of why, you know, they're pretty much tormented him because obviously he sees this as a game. He loves hunting. So rather than just killing his prey, he wants to hunt them and hunting them require for him, is it's tormented. Do you know what I'm saying? So mm-hmm. I think in that in terms of him saying, oh, joke, I'm actually a doctor. I think that was just part of his torment of his. Of, that was just literally a part of his play in terms of him tormenting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see where you're coming from. It just stuck out to me, like because this movie is so close to the original, like every change they make sticks out, mm-hmm. and this was one of those changes. Um, and there are other changes that just make the story worse. So, for instance, the whole thing about Agnes winding up in Paddy and Kiara's bed at night, and which is what prompts them to leave in the middle of the night, makes no sense in this version. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I, when I saw that scene, that was one scene which was a bit confusing. Like, I understand it is definitely weird for uh, another person's child to be sleeping in the bed with you. But mm-hmm. in terms of how it triggered her to just say, let's leave, I was like, OK, surely there should be a, like there could be a conversation had uh, before. Uh, uh, there, would be, there would be no conversation. No, no, that they leave makes perfect sense. But, uh, no, I, I'm, I don't know, because I but, don't get to I'm still going to leave, but I'm still going to have, like, a conversation. I'm not just going to, like, go the way that they went. On, on, top of, on top of all the weird things that have happened, your kid is now in bed with this random couple. You were leaving immediately. Like, without... Uh-huh. Especially especially if you can see that there's, like, the difference in physicality between the men's and this and and if this goes left, then you're in a bad situation, you would leave immediately without alerting anyone and then just, yeah, never see I that. I personally would have read that way, in my opinion. I literally just wake them up and be like, yo, what the hell is going on? And then that's when I'll pretty much vocalise that we're going. What you're saying is valid. You know, the couple was doing some weird stuff, so maybe they were trying to kind of, like, avoid, like, any further craziness that could happen. I get that, but mm-hmm. it's just the way that it happened seemed a bit abrupt, because how much weird stuff was actually yeah. going on before that scene actually happened? So... So just quickly, in in the remake, it just happens. And there doesn't seem to be much of a reason. In the original, Agnes keeps calling out to her parents and at least twice before they let her sleep in their bed at night because she's scared or she doesn't like she doesn't like it in the farm, whatever. And then the third time they ignore her because for the first time in the entire movie they are preoccupied with themselves. And so they ignore her, basically saying, Yeah, she'll she'll tie herself out, it's fine. Then she stops yelling. For, or calling for her parents. And then uh, Louise gets up, I think, to get a glass of water or something. And then in the ho- through, like as she passes through the hallway, she sees Agnes in the bed with the other parents. And that's where she freaks out. And so this is punishment for them being selfish. So hmm. there's a, like a, number one, there's a causal chain that leads that leads to that situation. And because that is there, it, re- it retains this ambiguity. Where essentially, and and they kind of the justification is still in the remake, where they say, well, your your child was calling out and you weren't helping, so we helped, right? And we're sorry if we overstepped, right? That is just excusable enough to kind of make sense, right? Even if the end result is over the line, but like you you, you can, you, they're they're throwing the blame back at the parents, right? And it's just plausible enough to kind of just be disarming, but in the remake we didn't see Agnes call out. That's the difference, and that's why it doesn't work. 
we heard Agnes call out and we saw the parents ignore uh, ignore her for no good reason. Yeah. Purely selfish. And then they have it thrown back in their face again, like why were you not there? And they don't have a good answer. But they mentioned it though. They they in, in that in the remake in that scene they there is no calling out to the parents and they don't ignore it. Not calling out to the parents, but the what's her name? Sierra mentioned that she was calling them. She was calling out. Right, but we don't see it. This is my point. So like, we, they took was, that out, but that that is what makes it work. What makes it work is that we saw Ben and Louise make that decision to ignore their child, and then somebody else crosses a, crosses a line, but they do it because they went there. Right. So the causality of it is very clear and very meticulous in the original, and it's kind of half of it is missing here. And therefore, it doesn't work as well. It's just my thing. So it's one of those things where they kept that plot point, but they left, they took out details, but the the entire chain has to be there for it to really work. That's kind of one of my criticisms of the of of this remake, is that they do this in a few different places. And I think this is the most egregious one because this is a really pivotal moment in the plot, right? Where for the first time they set up for themselves and do something, right? As opposed to sp- awkwardly smile through it, right? They could go back to bed and they could ignore it and not not bring it up, but no, this is where they actually take action. But they took out the pieces that get you there, right? It's like like a staircase where half the steps are missing. And they didn't replace it with something else that made an equal amount of sense. That is a change that does not work and actually makes the story worse. You know, I'll agree with you. Um, I'll definitely agree with you. But I think the reason why that scene worked in terms of when Sierra mentioned why she actually was sleeping with her, I think the reason why that worked was because she mentioned something, like she mentioned a piece of information which said to me, not only have they been paying more attention than the couple have realised, which is worrying, but it's believable. When she said that um, the door was scratching herself, Sierra pretty much mentioned the reason why she brought um, Louise's door with her to sleep was because she saw her scratching herself and obviously calling out for them. But when she mentioned scratching herself, I was like, oh, okay, cool, cool, cool. So I didn't even know that they really, because I don't think, what's the door's name again, sorry? Agnes. Angie. Agnes. I, I don't think she's ever scratched around them. So the fact that she mentioned that I was like, okay, so that's worrying because we we have even seen on camera that they've actually seen Agnes in that state. So they must have been watching her while she was sleeping. But I obviously, mean, from from holiday, because remember, remember on the vacation where they feel like they've lost the bunny, but then they kind of like miraculously turn up with this with the uh, comfort bunny. I, I feel like, which is a little bit haunting as well, because like we haven't seen them like kind of sort of know watching them or making observations of them, but they've already picked up but, that she. But got we do them. though. That's the thing though. We saw remember the scene where. Um, I, I don't know if they were sleeping or if they were arguing, but we see Sierra watching them from the window and then she leaves. That was when they were arguing, but that's like the, that's just a couple. But with that, so like yeah, you can you can imply that. Well, I mean from that scene, you can probably imply that they have been like maybe like watching them or spying them or like sort of making observations of them. But I'm just saying in terms of like them knowing that the scratching behavior and stuff like that, I feel like they've already kind of like understood what the bunny represented to her and probably what her situation was like when she didn't have that bunny in some uh in that from obviously the very start of the movie where they're sort of no the one to like have conveniently found the bunny and sort of no um brought it to them to then make that introduction and then actually start to get acquainted with this couple because obviously there has to be like an element of stalking your prey before you go hunting you have to like yeah. understand your prey before you go hunt, hunting That's and my I, point. Like, yeah. probably like just like that, that element that was missing but to, just to kind of like add to that as well in terms of so I Daniel, like I completely get your point. And I actually feel like it would have been beneficial to have like shown that the reason why I probably didn't think of it, or the reason why I didn't sort of know, kind of maybe acknowledge it in the movie or like sort of know, question it was just because I think there was like enough scenes of them trying to get Agnes to grow up and trying to get her to kind of grow out of her like her like bad behaviors in terms of like this like especially with like to do with the bunny and like how anxious she was in this uh, and this any other and and sort of know, saying that she can't be like that forever so they did give small hints but I do agree with you is that if they did show even if it was just one scene of her calling out and maybe they brought her in the first time and then maybe this you I, I, I do feel like it probably would have benefited from it but I just didn't question it because there was some groundwork, but probably not enough compared to what the original the original movie. So I'm gonna have to disagree. I actually take back what I said. I, I, I'm sorry. The reason why I'm gonna have to disagree with both of you is because 
my point, which was, however, you pretty much said it, is that they were stalking their prey and they didn't even realize. So I think what was happening is that they, the makers of the movie, was pretty much trusting us to actually see what's going on. And for me, like I said, when she mentioned the whole scratching thing, they didn't even realize that she knew that. So it was like they were, so they'd been stalked. And even the scene, like I said, when she was watching them from the window and they didn't even see and then she quickly disappeared. Like they've been stalking them. They've been using their weaknesses against them to get them in certain situations, like to make, to kind of like push them to make decisions that they want. So I think I I hear what you guys are saying, because even though I did say, yeah, they should have shown it. I'm like, actually, when you think of it, I think there was like, they were stalking their prey. Like, like yeah. you know, they were stalking their prey and there, were, and there were certain things that they were saying that was like, ah, like it kind of, you know what I'm saying? It kind of like brainwashed them or like made them subconsciously do yeah. what they wanted to do. And so it was just like, it felt very, like you said, it felt very psychological. So I think it was like they, their different approach that they used in this film in comparison to the original, for me, worked because, like I said, they were stalking their prey and they did certain things which was very stalkish. And like, you wouldn't have known if they weren't stalking them. And they didn't even realise it, which made it even more scarier. So <laughs> one other aspect of it, and an hour ago I said I wouldn't make this all about comparison to the to the original, but I've got another one is that in this end has a very active role, right? He takes a lot more action trying to warn the family and he shows the trophy room to Agnes, which doesn't happen in the original. Uh, and there's a lot of focus on him, basically. He he tries to warn Agnes in, mul in multiple places and he finally shows her that locked room, like was shifting the agency to end a good idea and did that work. I thought it worked really well in this movie, especially in terms of like his dynamic with the parents as well because you could see like any time that he was like making noise or like calling out or whatever uh in this I, th I think there was like a scene where they were like kind of like sat down and he's trying to write a note and I couldn't quite figure out whether he was just like foreign or I couldn't figure out what the right was, was Dutch was it Dutch okay yeah, so, yeah the note was in Dutch okay cool that's like a nice like another easter egg to this, the original one um but in, in terms of that like you could see was it Kira when he like starts to make noise when sort of, no, Agnes isn't understanding him she kind of gets up from a conversation that she's having with Louise and like goes across and obviously has to like be quiet and like shoving his mouth and this and the other. But mm -hmm. in terms of kind of like giving him the agency, it, it kind of makes sense because like if this is like the tenth or eleventh kid that they've kidnapped or however many that they've that they've sort of abducted, one is going to sort of know have a little bit more confidence and have like uh, a little bit more about them to try and sort of you know warn the other kid or try to like raise a concern as to like what's happening in this situation and mm. it, it just worked and, and again like in that situation you can like understand like the limitations and understand like sort of you know the difficulties that he's having like one he's Dutch in this and he hasn't got time to really like properly speak or whatever like that so he's trying to do what he can to like sort of you know warn her and doing it in clever ways as well to try and like mid, like sneak past the parents or whatever like that I, I thought it was great I thought it worked, worked well for me yeah he, he does apparently understand English so it's not clear to me why he can't write in English. Well, and well, there were yeah. So there were there was a bit a bit of a question mark. Another one was uh, I think I think his performance is uh, is amazing. Like, mm -hmm. like child actors are coin flip, and I think this one uh, is this really strong. And one thing it really like the performance really conveyed is what it's like to grow up in an abusive family, right? Because he was constantly afraid, mostly of Paddy, but also just really of his parents. And he was terrified of upsetting them, right? And I've seen some commentary from people who know this kind of dynamic, and they say, "Yeah, this is how it. This is how it happens." Right? That's the scene where he he, he stole the keys, right, to the trophy room, and he's trying to return it, and Paddy is awake, and so he can't just return the keys, and so they go through this whole like like the, through this whole deflection maneuver, right? And Paddy says to him, "Show love," which apparently is something abusive parents will say a lot, where it kind of becomes this performance and you have to kind of hit the right amount of appeasement. Uh, otherwise, things can get ugly. And so this whole sequence was really haunting. Like, like as somebody who's never seen that kind of dynamic up close in real life, it like I, I, I thought it, it conveyed what that must be like. Kind of this, this dance of, like in this case, it was made hyper-literal in terms of he's literally going to kill you if... If if you do if you say the wrong thing, but like in an allegorical way, it was about trying to survive an encounter behind closed doors with an abusive parent, right? And you kind of like uh, saw it in Paddy as well, in terms of like potentially some of the trauma that he carried from sort of his childhood into this, especially mm -hmm. like 
in the dance sequence where he's getting like angry and angry where like sort of no um the kid isn't getting it right um in, in terms of like the dance sequence and like his like abusive nature and they they it almost like the way that I took it in that particular scene was that like, it was like almost like his like reflection of his father and like how his father was probably to him and then him like then passing on that trauma trauma uh on to what was the kid's name again? And into into and that that's kind of how I how I saw it and it was like yeah like like you said like also quite... and small get stepped on true yeah nice nice little uh like, mm-hmm. nice little symbolism yeah, yeah but yeah no I I thought it was like although I don't think they leaned into it to you no know, too much obviously like it, it's not like the main focus of some sort of the story but I I feel like they kind of showed enough to like get the point across in uh yeah. on the fence. and Paddy at one time in the dinner scene also says. Something like parents will always mess you up yeah. just in different ways. And like there's no escaping it and kind of justifying to himself why he is the way he is. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that makes it a better story if he's got a reason for being this way other than it's just what they do. But it's it's, it's clear like this is this is clearly a, a sub theme in this, in this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, also like the dynamic between you know, Paddy and Kira as well, because if I'm not mistaken, it's almost like he, she was like maybe one of the original kids that he kidnapped and then made his wife. That's like, what she says. But you, she, you do, you can't. Like at one point, right? She tries to kind of get the trust of Louise and Ben Masikli, saying, "Take me with you. I was one. I was his first victim. Yeah. Don't leave me with him." But and then, I don't think you can you can you can tell if it's the truth or not, or if it's if it's if it's like a fake a fake out. But he does he does have a line when obviously he sees that she's dead. And then he's got Agnes and he says, oh, I'm not going to kill her. Like, she's going to be like the replacement for her, essentially. Yeah. So you can kind of like have that implication that maybe it was true. And obviously you can see, you can kind of like see the dynamic of like a victim or like survivor that's like sort of like, what's it called? Like, it's almost called like Stockholm Syndrome or whatever, where like, yeah, yeah. And like friends with an with a abuser. It's not focused on too much in the story, but the interesting dynamic between sort of no, the victim and sort of no, um, they were abusing sort of no, like spousal partner or whatever uh, in this as well, which was quite cool. Not not touched on, not explored as deeply as like some of the other things in here, but it, it was there and it was like quite interesting to see. And then just, just one more plot hole, because there was a few plot holes in this which looking back at it, I was like, ah, oh, this is really annoying that they've like put this in there. But there was that scene where they all go like jumping off a cliff into the like the lake. They were skinny dipping and I think everyone's like kind of like taking their clothes off or whatever. And I think in that scene, Ant doesn't have any of the bruises or any of like the cuts that he has on his body or, or no one even like notices it or like questions and questions it in that scene. But then there's another scene where he has his top off and then I can't remember who sees it. Maybe Ag- I can't remember if it's like Agnes or whatever, and then they're like, I think how she, how he got his bruises or, or whatever. He he, yeah, he, show, he shows. There's one scene where Anne shows him his scars and bruises. Yeah. So I like, don't know like, if there's another one where somebody just sees it. No, I, I think it's, uh, he shows it. I think he shows them. So it's, it's a bit like it's a little bit of a plot hole where they've yeah. got swimming. He's had his top off. They should have seen it, but then they've only seen it when it's convenient. Unless they're implying that in between that time. Paddy's abused him or he's like physically assaulted him in whatever capacity. Maybe maybe I don't know. But yeah, yeah, that that they maybe should have seen it, but that wasn't in the scene. Yeah, pretty much. We've mostly talked to the about this in contrast with a movie you guys haven't seen. I actually had sorry, I actually had one before we before we depart from that. Yeah. What's one change you think worked better in a remake than the original? I think this movie flows better. So the original is quite slow, quite heavy, quite draining. And this one is a much better watch. Like whatever else you think about it on a thematic level, on a writing level, it flows really well. I had a really good time watching it. And the same was not true of the original. The original is a bit more uneven in those, not not bad, but uneven in, in that area. And so that's kind of why I am so of two minds about it is that I think it's a really good movie, but it doesn't, it took out the bits that I liked about the original. Right? So that's kind of the thing. My, my, that's that's why I'm so so hung up on it. But I think one thing that really works, like just, just, just the overall quality in terms of how scenes flow. So <clears throat> that's kind of, even if I disagree with a bunch of the changes made, I think overall they lead to a movie that is really, really watchable. And it really turns in. I also think the siege sequence at the end is really well made. Like the physicality of it, the layout of the house, 
be sequence of esca- events and escalation, the amount of violence that they can use, just being just regular people who maybe who may have never fired a gun, like all worked. And I think it it's like its only problem is that the original ending was so much heavier and so much more unflinching about its about its cruelty. And if like to me, that's kind of the point of horror movies. That 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 kind of that's what a horror movie is supposed to do, and that is why I think this one turns into more of a thriller, where it kind of turns into an action movie at the end that ends with a happy end and the good guys winning, and kind of everything is okay and everybody is fine for the most part. And if you just take that sequence by itself, the last twenty minutes from when they try to leave to when they finally uh, have defeated everybody in the castle on fire and and half half of them are dead, it's it's just a really good action movie. I think this is where uh, expectations are important because that's not what I what I was there for. If I had been there for an action movie, then even like a like a thriller kind of kind of action movie, then I think I would have received it much better. But just on its own, the sequence is, is great. It's wonderful. Uh, and you were going to make a point before I interrupted you. Yeah. So I think <laughs> this movie is really overshadowed by the fact that it's a remake, right? That everybody who liked that movie is going to compare it to to what came before and I'm one of them and I can't really let go right like like even even now a couple of days later I still have a hard time uh, just watch or judging the movie on its own and I don't think I've ever seen a movie be remade after a year right this movie came out 2022 this has been in in the works since early 2023 so less than a year between when the original came out and when they started working on the remake and my big question is just why why do this why, why, why this quickly? Why this way? Did this movie need to be made, or should people just have spotlighted the old movie? Presumably, presumably they have the rights to it, so why not re-release this movie? I think they just made it this way because it's more um, accessible. Yeah. So the original is about 70-80% in English. So it's not even fully subtitled. Yeah. So the Danes speak Danish among themselves, the Dutch speak, speak Dutch among themselves, but when they talk to each other, they speak in English. And that's about 80% of the runtime. So it's not even even a foreign movie in that sense. Yeah. yeah. But usually a lot of times, obviously, they've got a star in it. So they've got a man like James. So a lot of the yeah. time when you have that star, you know, and obviously they think it's a really good movie, but they just say, okay, let's just remake this with a star and then it can be even bigger. So I, don't, I just don't think they had enough faith that the original would yeah. have had the biggest splash. Then the but original. we always say that the movie star is dead, right? So why does this matter? Why, why remake it with a big star like James McAvoy? That's what people say. I mean, well, that's just a conventional wisdom, right? That, that the movie stars, I think, of the 90s. And uh, people go to movies based on IPs and not based on actors. Which I don't think is entirely true, but I think it's partially true. I feel, I feel like there's mm-hmm. a lot more relate- relatability in having a British and American couple in this. Compared to, like, a Dutch and a Danish one. Uh, especially when you're, like, talking about a lot of, like, the nuances, which... A lot of people like if you're trying to sort of know uh, mass market this to sort of know wider audiences, you're trying to get like a big domestic box office in America and stuff like that. Maybe people aren't as aware of the nuances of sort of know the original movie. They don't understand sort of the Danish culture at all. So that when they're seeing the events of the movie unfold, I think like you mentioned, is that like you're almost questioning why they're allowing things to happen, especially like the scene that you mentioned about the guys left the keys in the car. Everyone, every normal person would be like. Yeah, you just take the car and go. So I, I I feel like there's just like that extra level of relatability in mm. having the couples being you know, a culture that you're a little bit more familiar with or like being you know, people that you do know. And of course, like changing some of the some of the nuances that made the original movie it, itself, because I, I I feel like they, they are very similar movie, but they do deviate in sort of you know, like in, in very important ways and sort of has like the big happy ending and stuff like that and that's just like a, a little bit more palatable to um your typical like your like the audience that would sort of bring in making the box office for this for the movie it's a little bit more palatable for them so so it's already made 21 million at the time we're recording this and the original danish movie made six hundred thirty one thousand dollars Mm. So it was a limited release. I don't know the exact details. So this definitely has made vastly, vastly more money than the original. And is that enough reason? I'm not convinced about it. Because you, you want, like, if, you, if you've got, like, a good thing, if you've got, like, a short thing, you do want people to see it. You do want people to appreciate it. Mm. And I don't know, maybe this helps people go back to the original and, you know, help people kind of, like, navigate back to the original. But 
I don't know where I sit on this because like part of me believes that you know you have your pure body of work and you know you don't want to have like any type of like remix out of there and like you know if if you've got like this like particular like I'm not saying it's a masterpiece but if you've got like this sort of thing that's like really great really good you want people to check out the original you don't want people checking out like the remade version of it but at the same time I kind of understand why they would do it and I understand why they would like go that route they've like made x amount more money uh it's it 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 does help big spotlight to the original because a lot of the discussion that I have seen is comparing sort of the original I mean I'm surprised the original made 600k for the amount of like conversation I've seen between this one and the original one I'm surprised it's only made 600 to 600k but maybe it helps spread uh, a little bit of a spotlight on the original movie as well it certainly did for me and I'm not the only one mm-hmm. it's 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 just normally you buy the rights to a movie and then remake it because of the IP right like we had last year we had Exorcist where they paid I think it was 400 million for the rights and that was because Exorcist is such a big name right that if you make a horror movie and it's an official Exorcist movie that by itself is extremely valuable, right? For And that will increase the box office. Before this, not many people had heard of Speak No Evil, right? So why not just make a movie that's kind of similar? But it's, if it's like thematically, it's quite different, right? We talked about the masculinity aspect. We talked about the um, domestic abuse as- aspect, which is quite different from the original in terms of theme. Like them- the, th- the thematic space of it is quite different. So why not simply make a movie that's a, that's quite similar in its plot, but actually about, actually about these other things with different actors, different location? Would they have gained that much from having the name? And I don't think they did. I don't think they did. No, like from the box office, it's only not not to say it's only done twenty one million, but it's obviously like not yeah. a, a, a mega hit. So I, I don't I don't think it's like gained too much from it. I, I don't know. I, yeah. it, it doesn't strike me as the kind of name that would bring in all the like it's not that big a cult classic i think it's well liked among a small crowd and i don't but but that's about it and i think the vast vast majority of people who went to see this just thought it looked interesting or they like james McAvoy or something but it's not because they like the original that much mm. i don't think so it's, it's just a little bit puzzling to me why may why remake this so quickly why pay for the rights to a movie that nobody's heard of so just a little bit puzzling, the whole thing. But I think what we got out of it was a pretty good thriller siege movie kind of thing. A fantastic thriller movie. Mm-hmm. Not pretty good, fantastic. All right, guys, so what's your last thoughts and ratings? Last thoughts. This was an excellent ride. This was, I don't want to say excellent ride again, but just like the sort of you know, the journey that this movie kind of like takes, takes us on, the sort of the acting in this performances everything like we, everything that we've touched on it's just it's just like a great movie overall like probably not, nothing more to kind of like say that, that we haven't already said on this so like i said second best movie of the year for me right up my like alleyway in terms of sort of know the type of movie it is so i would give this a strong nine out of ten for me um like i said i had to watch it twice at first watch i gave it a 7.75 second gave a borderline eight because this film for me is a borderline great film it's a really really good film borderline great film um i think you definitely need to watch it twice to kind of like see what's going on because when you watch it first i think you'll miss out on a lot of things you just see it as a film with a crazy couple just tormenting another couple for no reason but there's much more going on so i had a great time and like i said the couple they were just like i said they were amazing great performance all around great story i might watch it for the first time so, like I've said before, I'm of two minds of this. I can see what it's doing just as its own as, as its own piece. And now that we talk, we've talked about it, I have a clearer picture in my mind of what this movie is. But I think it is too close to the original to not be directly compared. And because I like the original so much, I can't help but notice all the things that are missing in this. So for me, it is simultaneously a five out of seven as a great thriller that's really watchable with great performances in it and an excellent sense of dread and tension and it's also a five out of nine for being our remake that misses the point and it's both of those things at the same time hi guys well we hope you've enjoyed today's discussion yeah let us know your thoughts have you seen the original have you seen the remake let us know which one you prefer what did you pick up 
are there any other themes that we missed in the remake but yeah leave those comments down below and of course don't forget to like share and subscribe all right guys we'll catch you next week au revoir ciao bye bye